to my friend and colleague, Cheryl, Cheryl Okayan. And welcome, Cheryl. Thank you so much for joining us today. And my pleasure. when we typically introduce people, we think about the different hats they wear. Yeah. So um, I'm going to say, first of all, you're my friend. She's a mom, a grandma, a wife, a Harvard Law graduate, uh, and um, made what we call Aliyah, left for Israel and practiced law. I just think this is so interesting in Jerusalem and was very successful, but had kind of like a little ache in her heart that she wanted to make a difference in education and joined Yad Vashem. And that move enhanced all that we do at Stockton University in our Holocaust Center. And um, I'm going to throw something at you because I know you can take throwing at you easily <laughs> that we didn't talk about before that we've been using this word Yad Vashem, echoes and reflections. And many of us don't know what that means. Now, even That's a strange name, Yad and Vashem, no idea. And echoes and reflections, all I know about an echo is when I hike, I can echo and hear my, you know, when I shout out, hello, you know, so... <laughs> Please, in the beginning, would you share with us a little bit about your hats? You can, and you can brag about your twins who are now nine months old, six months, six sorry, months. six months. We're not going to ask for a picture because by the time we get done, everybody will have their baby pictures up, moms, dads, grandparents, etc. So we'll move right into what is Yad Vashem? What is Echoes and Reflections? And I'll make this all in one introduction, but I'm throwing a lot to you, is that we have educators that come to us and say, how do I end all this? Or maybe it's just enough. And I see this all the time. I only have two weeks to do Holocaust and genocide studies. And I'm going to focus this year on the Holocaust. So I think for the two weeks, I'll just, because it's really very interesting, I'll talk about the ghettos and the concentration camps. And we're always amazed, and I know Irvin and Matt, who work with me in the Holocaust Center, are now shaking their heads of how many students come to Stockton and want to know if Anne Frank lives near us. Because right. they never knew they don't know the end of that story. They just read the diary. So we had discussed what will Cheryl do today? And we decided liberation and return to life because so many of us don't have the information to share with our students about liberation and return to life. And so that will be Cheryl's focus today after she talks to us about Echoes and Reflections, and Yad Vashem. Cheryl, thank you so much. And just um, reminder to everyone, we will end at 12 and about 1145-ish, we will be um, asking you questions. So please post your questions to Irvin again. And Irvin, you're doing a great job. And so is Matt. Thank you all. Okay, Gail. So that's that was quite an introduction. Thank you very much. I have I you gave me homework and I promised to get to all of that stuff. But before I even start talking, I have to give a shout out to all the people who I see as participants who have been with me in Echoes and Reflection seminars or, or who I've met online doing courses at Stockton um, so or who I've met through you, Gail. So I want to give a shout out to Doug and to Steve and to Lisa, and to Vicki, and to um, Carolyn, and to Nancy, who was with us last week uh, in Israel, and I hope she's feeling better. Um, so now that I've, I think I've covered everybody uh, who's on here, who I know, or I have met through you, Gail, um, let me share my screen, and we'll get right to it, and I promise to cover everything you asked me to cover. Um, so 
I'm going to share my screen and get up the PowerPoint, and then we will go through the whole business. So here we go. Um, also, I am going to try and make this a more interactive presentation. So I have some screens that use menti.com, and we'll get to them. And hopefully you guys will share your opinions and impressions with me. So as Gail said, we are talking about liberation and return to life because this, I believe, is the story about human spirit. You, you're at, you know, you're at that, that very last, that very last chapter in the book. And everyone thinks that liberation was the happy ending to a very difficult and dark story. And the bottom line is, it's not the happy ending to a sad story. It's a story in and of itself. Um, not always happy, very challenging, but it shows the human spirit so clearly what these people went through and had to come back and put their lives together and made the choice to do that. That's really where the whole thing shines. And that's why I think this is such a great topic to cover. Um, so here's my slide about Echoes and Reflections. Welcome. Echoes and Reflections is a partnership. Um, we are a program of three very heavy hitters in Holocaust education, the ADL, Anti-Defamation League, um, the USC Shoah Foundation, which is where we get all our testimonies, and Yad Vashem. What is Yad Vashem? So Yad Vashem is Israel's formal official Holocaust memorial. We were actually founded by an act of the Knesset, Israel's legislature, the parliament in 1953. And what does Yad Vashem mean? I know it's a very strange name. That's because it's Hebrew. It actually comes from the book of Isaiah. And the whole quote is, V'natati lahem beveti ubechomotai Yad Vashem asher lo yikaret, which means I will give you within my walls and within my house a memorial and a name that shall not be cut off. So Yad Vashem is a memorial and a name. And that is where the strength of the place comes from. That is our work. That's our bottom line is to give these people back their faces, their names, commemorate them, tell their stories. Um, and that's what we do. So three heavy hitters in the field of Holocaust education. Echoes and Reflections is a program for teachers. It's been running for, since 2005. Um, and so we have reached more than 100,000 educators all across the United States in all 50 states. Um, and uh, um, what else should I tell you about Echoes and Reflections? I think the most important thing that you need to know is that our approval ratings, when what we are very strong in monitoring and evaluation, um, we take our jobs very seriously. After every professional development session, we usually have an evaluation. Um, and the, the great thing about it is that 98% of the teachers who are introduced to ECHOES would recommend it to their colleagues. And I think that speaks volumes for ECHOES and Reflections. It's really that vote of confidence. Um, so without further ado, we're going to, you know, we're going to go, we're going to get right into things. And these are the, I hope I covered all the questions, Gail. I hope I, uh, I hope I did you proud on that one. Um, and there's so much to talk about that I think we'll just get started. Um, of course, if you have any other questions about Echoes, I, I should also say, I'm going to take a step back. You'll see that Echoes, and we'll be using the website. So my hope is that you will come out of here knowing the website better and being feeling very confident to use it, because that's what we're trying to instill in you, a sense of confidence when you teach about the Holocaust. Um, and I will say that even though the program has been running since 2005, we are constantly adding new resources, updating things. Um, two years ago, we put up an interactive timeline that is now probably one of the best resources that we have. It, it's, it includes testimonies, photographs, artifacts from our museum. It includes um, historical texts. Everything is downloadable, short videos, long videos. It, there's so much there. Um, I highly recommend it. Um, and we have also in the last two years, we have actually uh, updated all of our lesson plans so that they are more student facing, they're more inquiry based critical analysis. And um, there's a lot of good stuff that wasn't there before. And today I'm going to show you the liberation unit. And I'm very proud of it. As I was putting together this PowerPoint, I was thinking to myself how much better it is than it was six months ago. Um, there is so much more to it, so much more meat 
Um, you'll see. You'll, you'll make your own judgments, but I promise you it's good stuff. So these are our program objectives. We're going to discuss liberation. Was it simply a happy ending to the survivor's story? We're going to discuss the choices that were made by survivors after liberation and what it meant to return to life. That is an expression that we use when we talk about survivors because they had to make the choice, the affirmative choice to actually put their lives back together. It would have been much easier to raise their hands and surrender and give up and say, I can't do this. Um, but they didn't, most of them, most of them. And lastly, uh, we're gonna understand how liberation was an ongoing process. It wasn't just that one moment of liberation, you're free, that's it, go home, go back to your lives. It was a very long and difficult process um, and you'll see what the challenges were. So uh, without any further ado, oh, okay. The backbone of Echoes and Reflections are these pedagogical principles and I, I'm putting them up here. Um, we have a whole, and I'll show you where it is on the website. You will find these on the website should you, you know, not remember anything that I said today, um, hopefully you will, but should you not, uh, you will see that these pedagogical principles are in the website. Um, they, you can use them, you can refer to them, they are there for you. Most of them are common sense, defined terms, for instance. You have to define the Holocaust before you say what it is, before you teach about it. And we have a whole, a whole lesson plan on that. Um, background on the history of anti-Semitism, you can't teach the Holocaust without teaching about anti-Semitism. Contextualize the history, that's where the timeline comes in because we want students to understand that the Holocaust was not inevitable. It was the result of choices that were made by different people, by different nations, by different institutions. Um, and that's where the timeline really comes in handy, what came before, what came after. But the most important one in my view is number four, teach the human story. And that is what I will try and do with you today. Why are we so, um, why are we so deliberate about this? Why is this such a big deal for us? Because research has shown that when you tell a story, you, there's a part of your brain that lights up that doesn't light up when it's just, when you're only talking about statistics or when you're only talking about dates or places or names. You tell a story, it becomes something that people can grasp, something that they can relate to. You, you are developing empathy, and that is what we want you to do. That's why there are so many human stories in Echoes and Reflections. That's how we teach. So I think I'm done with the introduction. Um, and uh, it only took 15 minutes. What do we want our students to take with them when they study the Holocaust? That's a big question. And everybody's answer will be different. But for the purposes of this Stockton seminar, we are talking about the human spirit. You know, there are, we always say we want to prevent the next genocide and never again, and um, talk, talk about human rights and talk about civic responsibility and democracy. There are so many things that you can use the Holocaust to teach. That's what a lot of people don't understand. Of course, all of you do because you're here. Um, but one of the best things that you can use the Holocaust to teach is about the highs that human beings can reach. Most people think that the Holocaust is about the lows. It's about the depths, the, 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 the tremendous, tremendous lows that human nature can sink to and did sink to during the Holocaust. But the converse is also true. When you teach about all that darkness, you have to see some light also. And the light is these stories of the human spirit. And again, I contend that the liberation is one of the best stories about the human spirit. So we're gonna get right into things. Liberation of the Nazi camps, what shocking realities did liberation reveal to the world? And as I'm talking, I'm gonna jump in and out of the PowerPoint so that I can show you some of the things on the website. So you see all of these great headlines, right? The war is over, everybody is psyched, everybody is you know, kissing in the streets, celebrating. These are great pictures. This is a classic in Times Square on, on VJ Day in August of 1945. The whole world is celebrating, but what's happening to the Jews? And what's happening to the Jews is not the same. The whole world is celebrating, um, we say, um, the Jews are counting the dead or actually counting the living because there are so many dead to count. So what was liberation really like? 
In order to show you this, I'm going to first start with the website because I do want to show you all the great stuff that we have in the liberation lesson. So this is the website. As you can see, our motto is confidently teach about the Holocaust, and we give you all the tools to do that. Um, we say that all of these resources are accessible and curated for you. And of course, they're also free. When we use the word curated, all it means is we took everything and we stuck it in here. It's all there. All the stuff that I'm going to be talking about, other than a few of the pictures that I use, it's all on the website. So you're by the time we finish with this presentation, you're going to know how to teach liberation. You're going to feel more comfortable doing it. And you're also going to know where to find the things that will help you do it. So we're going to go into the teach section on that top toolbar. And when you open up the teach section, it looks like this. That first on the left rail um, resource inter overview, you will see underneath it pedagogy for instruction. And that is where we have that whole discussion of the pedagogical principles and not just the names either, but a whole discussion. So you'll be able to find it there. But I'm going to go to lesson plans. And when you open up lesson plans, this is what it looks like. We have 10 full units about the Holocaust and its aftermath. Each of those units has three or four lesson plans, comprehensive, fully developed with tanked up with all of those great resources. And we have an additional um, unit called the Green Glass Unit on Contemporary Antisemitism, which is great when you pair it with the antisemitism unit because you can see the through lines from classic antisemitism to the antisemitism of today, very important to talk about. Um, so of course, I'm gonna go to the Liberation Unit. And this is what it looks like. Um, all of our units basically look the same when you open them, and that's why they're so easy to use. We always have a big quote from one of the testimonies that we use right in the middle, and you can see this one is Anton Mason, who was a Jewish survivor, and he says, we are free, but how will we live our lives without our families? And that kind of just gives you an omen of what is to come in this unit, a, an inkling of the fact that liberation is not going to be Again, the happy ending to the sad story, but another story in and of itself. How will these people live with those challenges? So um, that is what the that is what the unit looks like. You can see on the right hand side we have keywords because we have a whole glossary in Echoes and Reflections. You can see some of those words have an icon next to them. Um, this this is also an audio glossary. So we will pronounce those words for you so that when you go into the classroom you will have the confidence that you are pronouncing those words correctly. Um, so you see, this is what the unit looks like um, and preparing to teach this unit, all kinds of information for teachers. I am going into the first PDF in the first lesson in this unit. This is a PDF, all our PDFs are downloadable, printable. And I wanna read you one of the quotes. I wanna start with this. Alan Moskin, who is an American soldier who liberated Gunskirchen, um, in Austria. And I had the great honor of meeting Alan um, a few years ago, said, I remember my buddies and I looked at each other. We knew Hitler wasn't fond of Jews, but we hadn't heard anything about concentration camps. So we're going to start with the perspective of the liberators. And that's how we're going to take you into this unit. Why are we doing it that way? Because this is a great connection to World War II history. If you're teaching American history, if you're teaching world history, this is a perfect way to connect it to the Holocaust. It's a bridge. This is what gets you in there. So you're gonna talk about the liberators, you're gonna talk about the American army, and then from there, you're gonna shift perspectives from looking at what the liberators found to looking at the people that they had that contact with. And I also want to show you, going back to that first page of the Liberation Unit, we are gonna be using the video toolbox. Um, we have six video toolboxes in Echoes and Reflections. If a unit has a video toolbox, it always appears in the same place so that you can find it. So now I am actually going to jump out of the PowerPoint and into the internet. And you don't want to see my inbox, so we're going to get right out of there. Um, let me hide these floating meeting controls. And we're going into Echoes and Reflections. Okay, so you've already seen how the website works. Now you're going to see me use it. We're going into Teach. And once Teach opens, we're going to go into the lesson plans. 
I'm opening the lesson plans. I'm going into the liberation lesson plan. And again, you've already seen this. So from here, I'm going to open the video toolbox for you. And we're gonna watch just the first few minutes. I just want you to get a feel for what these toolboxes are like. Yad Vashem works very, very hard. We produce these toolboxes. We work very hard to make these toolboxes um, accurate because there is a tendency sometimes during Holocaust movies to use just any pictures that you can find. These pictures relate specifically to the places that we're talking about, to the times that we're talking about. We were also very, very careful because you can use these. These are all under 15 minutes long, so you can use them in class. And we are very careful not to use Holocaust pornography. No bodies, no corpses. And it's extremely hard to make a movie about liberation without using pictures of corpses because all of the American soldiers who were present at liberation and all the other soldiers of the other allied armies were taking pictures of the corpses. They could just not believe how many corpses they were finding. So we worked very hard to make this a corpse free movie. Um, and again, we're gonna start with the perspective of those liberators. Sorry. The man came up to us and said, there's a factory about a mile down the road and you will find a lot of Jewish women in there that were dropped there and the SS is guarding them. We opened the, the, this shed, we went in there. Though fighting still raged in the Pacific theater, World War II in Europe officially ended with Germany's unconditional surrender on May 8, 1945. Allied armed forces advanced across Europe in the war's final stages, relentlessly pursuing the retreating German army. As they did, they stumbled onto camps, often accidentally, that had been established and run by the Nazis and their local collaborators. The Soviet army, advancing from the east, liberated Nazi camps in Poland, including Majdanek and Auschwitz. The British and Canadians, advancing from the west, liberated Bergen-Belsen and camps in northern Germany. The Americans, our focus here, liberated Dachau, Buchenwald and other camps. As their armies advanced across Europe, the Allies found thousands of people imprisoned in camps. They encountered piles of corpses and thousands of skeletal prisoners on the verge of death from malnutrition and disease. This was their first encounter with the horror of what would come to be known as the Holocaust. They began to understand that the Nazis had committed atrocities against civilians, the vast majority of them Jews, on an unimaginable scale. And that these atrocities were very different from the deaths caused by conventional warfare. A new category of crime had to be recognized to describe the intentional attempt to destroy a people. This crime came to be known as genocide. The soldiers were the very first outside witnesses of the Holocaust, an unprecedented case of genocide. The testimonies of the first soldiers who entered the camps, known as the Liberators, are important eyewitness accounts of the mass atrocities committed against the Jews of Europe by the Nazis and their collaborators. Hardened combat veterans, the American GIs were used to death. Many had been fighting for years, but they had never seen killings of civilians 
on the massive scale they discovered. Their first encounters with Holocaust survivors at this unique moment in time give us an essential and intensely human perspective on the difference between military war and genocide. Leon Bass was 20 years old and was among the first U.S. soldiers to arrive at Buchenwald. I can never forget that day because when I walked through that gate, I saw in front of me what I call the walking dead. I saw human beings, human beings that had been beaten, had been starved, had been tortured. They had been denied everything. They had skeletal faces with deep set eyes. Their heads had been clean shaved and they were standing there and they were holding on to one another just to keep from falling. I saw the clothing of little children, the little children that didn't survive. Up against the wall there were mounds of clothing. I saw the caps, sweaters, the stockings, the shoes, but I never saw a child. Harry Mogan was a Jewish refugee from Nazi persecution. He reached the United States and became a soldier and a liberator. And, and you saw uh, women on, on, on the floor on, on wooden pallets. When I say women, you saw skeletons, rags hanging on them, no shoes, bones instead of faces. And the stench was so horrible. It's hard to describe. What the American soldiers found at Ordruff, a subcamp of Buchenwald, was so grisly that General Dwight D. Eisenhower, then the supreme commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force in Europe, together with Generals Patton and Bradley, arrived to inspect the camp for themselves. After his visit, Eisenhower cabled, The things I saw beggar description. The visual evidence and the verbal testimony of starvation, cruelty, and bestiality were so overpowering is to leave me a bit sick. I made the visit deliberately in order to be in a position to give first-hand evidence of these things, if ever, in the future. There develops a tendency to charge these allegations merely to propaganda. These words are now engraved on the wall of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. Okay, that's just an introduction to under, so that you understand what these toolboxes are like um, and how you can use them. Um, I think they're, I mean, granted I worked on it, but I think they're great. Um, I think they're great resources for teachers. And so now I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna jump back into my um, PowerPoint. We're gonna be going back and forth. Um, so that is really you know, the, the uh, perspective of the liberators. And having seen the perspective of the liberators in that short film, um, I would ask you to go to menti.com and we'll try and make this a little bit interesting and a little bit interactive. So if you have a, um, a telephone, that's what that's called, or a laptop that you're working on, go to menti.com. And when it asks you for a code, use the code 27876258. I will read it again. 27876258. Five eight. Um, so once you go to Menti and you use that code, you will see I'm going to be asking you this question. What's the importance of the liberators firsthand eyewitness accounts of Nazi mass atrocities? Because this is also a great way to get into this whole issue of, um, let me get rid of this, to get into this whole, I'm sorry, to get into this whole issue of uh, genocide and teaching about genocide um, and how we got to genocide, um, how, we, how we got to this whole issue. All right, so let me, what is it that I'm doing here? Yeah, that's what I wanna do. I'm gonna go into Menti. I have to move this again. And okay, great. So you, some of you guys are already in there and the word cloud is starting to come up. I love when this happens because it's very exciting to me when you guys start to, to start to populate the word cloud. Um, so you're saying that the importance of the liberator's firsthand accounts, human emotional response, primary source, great, 
best evidence, wonderful viewpoint, proof, accuracy, undeniable. That's very important, right? Evidence, witness, accuracy, veracity, emotional, visceral. I see visceral empathy. You guys, you're terrific. Terrific. If you want, keep them coming. But I think you get it. You see that the biggest and I love how it moves. You see that the biggest um, the biggest words in the word cloud, primary source, evidency, proof, and truth is now in there. So that's wonderful. Um, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much. I'm gonna we're gonna cut that one off. I'm gonna go back into the power, into the presentation because we've got a lot to talk about. So that's where we start from. Okay, we're gonna start from the, the liberators, but very quickly, we really wanna we really wanna understand. This is what the liberators saw, but what was the other side feeling? What was going on with the people that they found when they liberated these camps? What were the challenges that Holocaust survivors faced upon liberation? So just to show you, this is one of the PDFs that we have in the unit, and I am going to read it to you on a separate slide so that I could make it bigger. On the third day after the liberation, a Red Cross car pulled up and a British officer got out. He told me that he would take me to a shower and give me clean clothes. Until then, I had been wearing the striped clothes of a Ketsetnik. Ketsetnik is a concentration camp um, inmate. I was given white bread with butter and jam and sweet cocoa. I ate as though I had never before tasted these things. It had been years since I had consumed such delicacies. Afterwards, I washed in a real shower with hot water and soap. They gave me a German army uniform to wear, the swastika still sewn onto the chest. I suddenly threw up all the marvelous food I had eaten earlier. The next morning, I could not even lift my head. My health head felt so heavy that it seemed to be made of lead and it hurt terribly. An ambulance arrived and took us to the hospital. In the hospital, they stripped me in order to wash me down, but I couldn't stand or even sit. They then put me on a scale and the nurse who weighed me called out to her colleague, can you believe it? Only 28 and a half kilos, 63 pounds. That sentence rings in my ears to this day. And that is the testimony of Chaim Kuznitsky. So, you know, one of the problems after liberation with these people who were so debilitated, whose, whose digestive systems were so destroyed and damaged after four, five, six years of not having enough to eat, the allies thinking that they were helping these people overfed them. And we know, for instance, that at a place like Bergen-Belsen, 14,000 14, people died after liberation from overeating. So that's Chaim Kuznitsky's testimony. Um, this is also from that same PDF. This is the bottom part. So this is also in echoes. Take a look at the numbers, the statistics, 75% required hospitalization, 20,000 suffering from dysentery, 10,000 tuberculosis, 3,500 came down with typhus, and 500 people every day died in the first weeks after liberation. That's tough stuff. That's tough stuff. Um, how will the survivors deal with this? One of the new testimonies that we put into the unit, aside from Chaim Kuznitsky's testimony, which is also new, um, you will see, is this testimony from Charlotte Cheney. And Charlotte, and I'm gonna go back into the website to play this for you. Charlotte, you will see right down here, I'm gonna scroll down and you'll see the whole thing being laid out for you. Here's the liberation of the Nazi camps, the first lesson plan. And you'll see how granular it is. We do all the work for you. Part one, what shocking realities did the liberation of the camps reveal to the world? Post the supporting question. You project the handout. You watch the video toolbox. You ask questions like the one that I asked you. And there's a letter that's distributed. Part two, we actually have what were the experiences of Black and Japanese liberators. I'm not going to go into that today because we are talking about the survivors and we do want to talk about the human spirit. But just know that that is there. It is a very interesting part of this unit, especially because these Black and Japanese liberators were fighting for the United States, fighting to liberate these victims of concentration camps at a time when they were in segregated units. And that is very important in American history. And it's very important also in teaching the Holocaust, because if we're talking about human rights, that's a very important story to tell. So it is there. 
not going into it today, um, but you will see that it is there. And we do have a lot of testimonies, as you can see on the right rail from Leon Bass and from, from Paul Parks and, um, and, uh, and one of the Japanese liberators, Katsugo Mihu. So still scrolling down because I wanna get you to Charlotte's testimony, which is right here. Now, one of the things that I always say, when we play a testimony, in, in class, when you as an educator play a testimony in class, you would never bring a guest into your classroom and just say, all right, just start talking. The kids don't have to know who you are, just tell your story. You always wanna introduce them, especially Holocaust survivors. And that is why wherever you see a testimony on the right rail, you will always see in the within the lesson plan embedded is a link to a bio. And this is Charlotte's bio, you can see here, we give you a lot of information so that you will understand who it is that is speaking to your kids and how do you deal with her. So um, Charlotte was basically, her testimony is here because she was a nurse and she was assigned to the Dachau concentration camp after liberation. And that is what she is going to be talking about in this very brief, um, this very brief testimony. So let me hide this. And I am going to play her testimony for you right now. These were people, you have no idea, the skeletons, actually skeletons, how they could walk around. Uh, there were people from all over Europe. I remember taking a couple people out of the compound. We would put them on cots to take them into the barracks. What we try to do is to give plasma to these people. Now, if you ever saw an arm as big as a circle of your hand get into a vein, uh, food, we had to be careful. They could not digest meals. We would start off with a gruel, try and s start with that. But before we even did that, we had to, we had to de-louse them. There was tuberculosis, there was typhoid, there was dysentery rampant. Uh, we wore gowns, we wore masks, we had our heads covered, we wore rubber gloves. And at that time, the only thing that we knew of in 1945 was DDT, powder DDT. And we tried to take them out of the compound and we would shave their heads and uh, wash them down give them a clean gown and put them into a bed and try to explain to them that they will get food. We will feed them. If we gave them even bread, they would hide it under the pillow. And we told them that they didn't have to hide anymore. In a testimony like that, there is so much that you can do with it. And I'm sure you're already thinking. I'm sure your, your minds are going and you're already thinking about how could you use this testimony? First of all, let me just show you a picture that I that I found. And this is actually a picture that Liz found. I should correct myself. Um, that really fits so nicely with this testimony um, called Human Laundry. And you can see how thin these people were. And when she describes being able to circle their wrists, that's so tactile. It's so graphic. I think it, it really, you can really see it. Um, and then when she says that they gave them bread, but these people used to hide bread under their pillows. Well, why? Why were they hiding bread under their pillows? Of course, we know the answer, but it's a great question to put to your students because they were so afraid of going hungry because they had been starving for so long. Um, so you're getting, we're starting to get into um, what's happening to these people. And we're starting to talk about really their experiences. And um, I want one of the new things, again, in the, in the unit now that has made it such a much better unit than it was before, um, is that we have three artifacts that we've included in the unit. This is one of them. This is a shaving brush. Um, we had a survivor um, from Sal Salonika in Greece who used to come speak to us at Yad Vashem. Uh, he has since passed on. And his name was Jackie Hendley. And Jackie tells the story of how he was liberated by the British Army at Bergen-Belsen um, on April 15, 1945. But he became friends with an American soldier named Joe Raspanti. 
And Jackie was the story, as, as I heard Jackie tell it, Jackie and his friends were looking for food and they had chased, they had found a chicken and chased it from the British area of Bergen-Belsen into the area where the American soldiers were. The chicken was running and they were running after the chicken and they, I guess, caught the chicken or came up against these American soldiers and one of them was Joe. And what Jackie says about Joe is this, he took us to the field showers, removed our clothes and threw them into the fire. That's another great question to ask your kids. Why was it necessary to burn their clothes, right? You already heard about typhus and lice and delousing and DDT. We were given towels and for the first time I had soap, scented soap and hot water. We took our towels into a tent where there were several soldiers. They laid a blanket on the ground and began throwing all sorts of things onto it. If they had two pairs of shoes, they threw in one pair, as well as chocolate, cigarettes, clothes, and underwear, everything that you could imagine. We got dressed in American uniforms and we received special food. Now take a look at this shaving brush and think about this for a second. Jackie wrote on the bottom of the shaving brush, he wrote the date, and that's backwards for Americans, but it's April 17th, 1945. So this is two days after he was liberated. It's such an emotional thing. Why does a survivor, and he held on to that shaving brush, okay? He held on to it until he donated it to Yad Vashem. Why would a survivor hold on to a shaving brush? Why would he write the date on the bottom? So if you've still got your mentees open and keep them open because um, there are a couple more mentee instances that I'm gonna ask you for. By the way, this is our artifact analysis, another great addition to the unit. This is a graphic organizer where we basically do a see, think, wonder analysis about those artifacts with the students. So again, it's all there for you to use. That's the beauty of Echoes and Reflections. So if you've got your mentee open, and again, the code is 2787-6258, this is the question that I wanna ask you. What was the significance of this artifact to Jackie, to the Holocaust survivor? This is one of the questions that comes from the unit. And so I'm asking you, what was the significance? I know I have to advance the slide. Hang on, I will find it and I will get there. Um, what was the significance of this artifact to the survivor in question? And here we go. This is also gonna be a word cloud and you should be seeing it now. So, um, Tell me, you have three words. You can use three words here. What is the significance of this artifact to the Holocaust survivor? Because we're talking about return to life. We're talking about how they return to life. We're talking about hope. Oh my God, that's amazing. How it shows up like that right in the middle of the screen. So big, thank you so much to whoever wrote that. Humanity, I'm sorry. You got me. Hope, humanity, personalized. Love, kindness. You guys are just bowling me over. Seen, somebody who is seen. Ownership, personal property for the first time. Amazing, amazing, you guys. Normalcy, that's so important because they hadn't had normalcy in so long. So personalized, hope, humanity, love, kindness, personal property, seen, ownership, normalcy. And we've got humanity as the biggest term in there. Humanity returned, met needs, a love, wonderful friendship. You did my heart good. I'm so glad I put this mentee in the presentation. You really, you got it. You nailed it. Thank you very much. I'm going to go back to the presentation. I'm going to catch my breath and go back to the presentation. You, you really did it for me. Thank you so much. Okay. You got it. So that's the significance of the artifact. Um, and now let's, let's explore a little bit more what's going on with these, with these survivors. Maria, Miriam Akavia, who is um, uh, a survivor who lived in Israel. Um, this is one of a quote from her. I thought I should be happy. I felt the tears, but I knew I should be happy. I started crying all the time thinking, what have I got left? So you're starting to understand where these people were 
when they were liberated, what was going on in their minds, they were in a very, very low place, very low place, because their humanity had really been taken away from them. And now, how do they get their humanity back? What will it take to make them human again? So um, another terrific resource, brand new, that we have in this, in this unit for you are three letters from a book called After All That Pain and Anguish, First Letters After Liberation, that was edited by Rob Rosette and Yael Nidam Orvieto from the Yad Vashem Institute for Historical Research. And I'm gonna read one of them to you, okay? Um, there are a couple others, there are, they are very touching letters and they are first letters after liberation, exactly as the, uh, as the PDF says. Again, this is a PDF that's printable, downloadable, et cetera. Undated, my dearest brothers and sisters, we received your letters from October 25th and 28th. I am your sister Chava, who is writing this letter to you. Your sister, who miraculously managed to escape the clenched jaws of the vicious dogs. What more can I say to you, my dearests? Trust me, I don't know where to begin. Shall I start with the monstrous crimes the fascist dogs committed? The many different methods they used to murder us all? You have surely read all about it. Those who never lived through these experiences are obviously incapable of comprehending them. We endured hellish years. Yes, my dearests, we are no longer human beings because we don't have any human feelings left except for the awful pain in our hearts. There is no solace for us and there never will be until the day we die. Now I am asking myself, where shall I go? Whom will I meet at home? To whom shall I go? There is no home, there is nobody. Only graves and ruins are awaiting me. I traveled home knowing I would find there only ruins. Just imagine how it is to live in our town where all of us used to be together. Every path and every street is drowned with blood and reminds us of so many things. One must be as tough as nails in order to be able to endure all this. And we are strong yet at the same time, petrified and frozen. I am closing my writing, stay well and strong. Your sister who is thinking only of you, Chava. There's a lot to unpack here. I'm not even going to start. I just wanted you to know that this is in the unit. This is the type of thing that I would use with high school students, not necessarily middle school because it is complicated. She's talking about fascism. She's obviously um, very wrought, very emotionally wrought. Um, what does it mean? We don't have any human feelings left except for the awful pain. There is no solace and there never will be until the day we die. That's very, very bleak, very black. So I wouldn't go there with younger students, but I would definitely use it with high school students um, because it is so powerful. Um, and so I wanted you to know that it was there. This is a picture, a photo, um, that is on the wall of the Liberation Gallery in Yad Vashem in the museum. And I took the liberty of pairing it with that letter because I think it shows you the despair of these people. They understand that they have no homes, they have no relatives, they have no friends, they have no community, they have no place to go. And that is the, that is the, the, the irony of being liberated, right? You would think that they're free. So one more menti for now. And again, the code is 2787-6258. And your question this time is, what were the emotional challenges and overwhelming hardships that survivors had to cope with as they faced their future lives? So, um, and if you're getting tired of the menti, I hope you're not because I love them. They're great. Um, let's advance the slide here. We will go back and then we will go forward. Um, okay. Here it is again. Again, I will read the question for you. What were the emotional challenges and overwhelming hardships that the survivors had to deal with? And this one is not a, um, a word. It's not a word cloud. This one you can put in, you can, it's kind of an open-ended sentence. You can write um, you can write a sentence or two if you want to, and let's see what you're thinking about. What were the emotional challenges and overwhelming hardships that survivors had to cope with as they faced their future lives? That's very interesting. Survivor guilt is the first one there. Absolutely. 
something that we don't always think about, um, that these survivors are going to feel guilty because they were the ones who survived. Trying to find hope after loss, absolutely. Where do I go? Let me just move this. Where do I go and where's my family? Realization that they may be the only member of their family to survive, and many of them were. In Italy, 75% of the survivors questioned were the sole survivors of their family. Depression, how do you rebuild when everything has been lost? Family, material items, attempting to live, not simply survive. Feelings that only other survivors could understand. Unending loneliness. The survivors are faced with the unknown. Where do they go? Who will help them? I have nothing literally and figuratively. How to go on, depression, anxiety, lonely, loss of family, homes, and their way of life. You guys, you are terrific. Thank you so much. Because I see where your heads are and, and they're in the right place. Um, I hope I'm not blocking anything else. Okay. Um, that's exactly where, that's exactly what we want everyone to be thinking about. And that's that's exactly what this lesson is about. So, so now we have talked a lot about the horrors and the bleakness and the loneliness and, and all of these terrible, terrible, overwhelming emotions that the survivors are feeling. Okay, so you're asking me, all right, Cheryl, where is the human spirit stuff already? Let's get to the human spirit. So I'm getting there slowly. I wanted to warm you up a little bit. How did the survivors actually return to life? And these are such great stories. Echoes and Reflections managed to exist somehow for 15, 17 years without Gerda Weissman Klein. Um, but this year we rectified that situation and we included Gerda um, in the unit. So I'm going back into the Echoes unit, into the real, real unit. And I am, remember, we are scrolling down, scrolling down. How did survivors begin a return to life? And you can see we've got three different testimonies for you here that will take you um, into the answer to this question. We want you to know about Gerda. So here is her bio, although I can tell you that she was born in Poland. She survived a lot of different camps. Um, but you can see all of the information right here. She has a beautiful, amazing book called uh, All But My Life, which was made into a movie. Um, and was also it also got a, an Academy Award, believe it or not. So Gerda is, Gerda is something. And you must listen to this testimony because she says so much in this testimony. Again, um, perfect testimony to use in teaching about this subject. My clearest recollection, so there were some two Americans at night but my clearest recollection is that of the morning. The SS had departed, they left their great coats, put on civilian clothing. I stood in the doorway of that factory. I knew I was free, but somehow the reality of it, uh, you know, I prayed for it for six years, in every waking hour. And I couldn't, I couldn't absorb the wonder of, of perhaps freedom until a crushing, almost overwhelming joy by seeing a strange car coming down the hill. No longer green, the white star of the American army on its hood and two men in unfamiliar uniforms sat in it. I stood in the doorway. And one of them, we gathered them to be Americans, jumped out and he came toward me. And I was looking at him with incredible awe and disbelief. But I was looking at someone who fought for us. Of course, I was terribly frightened what, you know, what his reaction would be if I tell him we are Jewish. But I felt him I had to tell him. So I looked at him and I said, we are Jewish, you know. He didn't answer me, which seemed to me eternity. And then he said, so am I. This was the greatest moment of my life. Then he asked an incredible question. He asked if he could see the other ladies. Obviously a form of address we hadn't known and heard. And I told him that most of the girls were inside. They were too ill to walk. He asked me to come with him. I didn't know what he meant. He held the door open for me and let me proceed him. 
and restored me to humanity again. And he has been holding the door open for me now for 50 years, my husband. Quite a cry. Well, pretty soon trucks came, Red Cross trucks. They took us into a makeshift hospital. I had the first bath in four years, five years. I, uh, all my clothes were gathered to be burned. I went into the lining of my boots. There were two things there. One, some poison which I had bought in one of the camps for the last piece of jewelry that was sewn into my clothes. It was against the day when we would be put into a camp to apparently amuse Germans, and I knew that, that I didn't need to keep my promise to my father, and I'll kill myself first. I let it gladly go to destruction. And the other thing was a little bundle of the pictures of my parents and my brother, an abic which I carried in my boot, and that, of course, I saved. And I uh, was given a bath, and a red, not red, a blue and white checkered shirt, men's shirt, which was sort of like a nightgown. And taken to bunks with sheets, the first time I slept in sheets for years. And the nurse came and carried a tray with warm milk. And one of the cups had a flower on it. And I desperately wanted that cup with the flower. And I got it. And I started to drink the warm milk lying in bed. And this is when I started to cry, and I cried for days. And I wondered what happened to this first young American to whom I gave my name, but I didn't know his name. And I realized that the war was still going on for a day or two, and I wondered if he was, if something happened to him. And strangely enough, that night I started to pray again, and I prayed for his safety, not realizing that I was praying for the safety of my husband. I love that testimony. It's a little on the long side, but it's just such an amazing testimony. And again, there are so many things that she says in that testimony that you can use. Um, when she talks about crying and crying for days, um, when her husband gives her back her, her husband, whose name is Kurt Klein, her future husband, gives her back her humanity in that one gesture of holding the door open for her and asking where are the other ladies, which they hadn't been referred to as in so long. The fact that she remembers the flower on that cup and how much she wanted the cup with the flower and she got it. There's so much wonderful stuff in this testimony. I will let you discuss it with your classes and I will move on. Um, but you can see here, we also have another great graphic organizer. This is also brand new um, to help your students with these testimonies, to take them apart. What were the physical and emotional challenges? that each of these survivors was facing and what were the signs that they were returning to life, that they were starting to feel hope again. So, you know, this is just to make it that much easier for you. It's all there. Um, this is a great photo from Bergen Belsen where you see this woman who is so skeletal and yet she has this radiant smile on her face. She probably can't stand up by herself. She's leaning against a tree. She's wearing clothing that's too big for her. But <clears throat> she still has this huge smile on her face. So we're starting to feel the hope. We're starting to feel the resilience. Um, this is Itka Zygmuntovich. Itka figures in the final solution lesson in Echoes and Reflections, which is why I put her in here. Um, because Just because she's one of our favorites. But... Um, 
she says the first time she saw herself in the mirror after liberation, she says, I became hysterical. I started to yell. I didn't look like a woman at all. I had no hair. I was wearing this striped tattered dress without undergarments and a pair of beaten up unmatched wooden clogs. I had no one left to love me, to help me or to miss me, which is why these things are so significant, why these small gestures are so significant. And this is something else that we have in this unit. This is an excerpt from Night. Um, we have another excerpt from Night in the Final Solution Unit, but this is also new and included in the Liberation Unit. And those of you who, are, who teach English will recognize that this is the end of the book where Elie Wiesel writes, our first act as free men was to throw ourselves onto the provisions. We thought only of that not of revenge, not of our families, nothing but bread. And even when we were no longer hungry, there was still no one who thought of revenge. Three days after the liberation of Buchenwald, I became very ill with food poisoning. I was transferred to the hospital and spent two weeks between life and death. One day I was able to get up after gathering all my strength. I wanted to see myself in the mirror hanging on the opposite wall. I had not seen myself since the ghetto. From the depths of the mirror, a corpse gazed back at me. The look in his eyes as they stared into mine has never left me. The power of those few lines um, is not gonna be lost on your high school students. You, you need to delve into it. You need to interpret it. What is he saying here? What is he, what, is, what does that say about Holocaust survivors? Will they ever be able to get over the trauma that they experienced. Um, you can really take it apart. You can sink your teeth into it. You can unpack it. Um, and that's what we do in the unit. Um, many survivors were the sole survivors of their entire families. And really, how was it possible to go on with life after losing all that they knew and loved? So here's another quote. Um, Antonia Rosenbaum, one day an American officer came and said, we, much, we want very much to continue to help you, but we can't, the war isn't over yet, and you have to go home. The moment he said home, it was as though everything came crashing in on me. What is home? Where is home? Where do I have a home? Who will I go home to? I started to yell, I don't have a home. I'm not going home. So he told me, I can't keep you here. Two beautiful things that we have in the unit that are brand new are these resources. And this is where we use, you know, sometimes you just heard from Liz and sometimes the power of art or poetry is so strong or literature, like what you heard in, in Elie Wiesel, is so strong. Sometimes it transcends words. Sometimes you will always have learners who react differently to a painting than they would to a testimony or differently to a poem than they would to an artifact. Um, and so we have included for you in the lesson, this painting by Samuel Bach called Children Alone in the Landsberg DP camp done in 1946. And what we ask you in the unit is, what does it say about the survivors? How does it represent a new beginning? Do you see hope? Do you see despair? What do you see in this picture? And we have paired it with this poem called My Life Has Started From the End by Helena Birnbaum, who's a survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto and Majdanek and Auschwitz and many other labor camps. And I'll just read you the first few lines. My life started from the end. First, I have known death, then birth. I was growing amidst hatred in the kingdom of destruction only to learn later about creation. So I leave it to you to use these great resources with your students. I'm not going to go any further on that because I want to get to your questions um, and I don't want to run out of time here. Okay. We, you know, the survivors are just starting to put the pieces of their lives back together. Many of them are trying to go home. One of the things that was always absent from this unit before was the pogrom in a place called Kiltz in Poland. Um, after the war in 1946, on the 4th of July, as a matter of fact, 1946, there was a terrible pogrom. Now the war is over. Um, the Germans have gone. These people have come out of concentration camps. They've come out of hiding. They've come out of wherever they, they were, from attics, from basements, from the ones who survived. And they managed to try to make it home. They're on their way home. 
Many of them are congregating in this place in Kelts in this one specific building. And there is an accusation that is made against one of these people, one of these Jews, survivors who has returned home that a Christian child was taken and abducted and kidnapped and that the Jews were about to use his blood to make matzah. If that sounds kind of uh, familiar to you, then it ties right in with our anti-Semitism lesson because the whole issue of blood libel is something that we discuss in the anti-Semitism lesson and also in the contemporary anti-Semitism lesson because it is still going on in the world today, this type of accusation. In this case, unfortunately, what happened after the accusation was made was that many workers came from where they were working. These are all Polish workers. Um, there was anti-Semitism was rife in Poland after the war. They were, a lot of them were afraid that the Jews were coming back to claim their property, which the Poles had moved into. I am not casting blame here. I am just reciting some facts. And we never really dealt with this before, but it's a very important part of the story. Why? Because after this pogrom, many Jews left Europe. They realized that Europe was saturated with blood, that this was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back, that they couldn't go back to their home. So this is a real turning point. And I'm very happy to say that we have it for you now in the unit so that you can teach it to your students because it does tie into anti-Semitism and contemporary anti-Semitism. And we do have a testimony from Rachel Huber, who was a Romanian Jew who found herself on a train. Um, it's a short testimony, so I think maybe I'll take the risk. I don't wanna take the risk and play it for you. I still have other stuff to get to and just a few minutes left before questions. Um, so just know that it's there. She basically says, it was a horrible, horrible thing. We didn't believe that such things could still happen, but you hear the voice of a witness to this pogrom. And I think that's very important. There were 42 Jews who were killed during this pogrom in this one place on this one day. Um, but we think that about 1500 Jews were killed throughout Poland after the war. Um, so let's skip this menti. Um, and then we get into the subject of DP camps because that is the next phase in the story. So to make it easier for me, um, first of all, here is the PDF that we have in the unit about displaced persons. What does that mean? What's a displaced person? Um, and to make it easier for me, I've got a piece of a film that I wanna show you. This is um, from Yad Vashem's video toolbox series. It's a seven minute long film. I'll just show you a little piece of it. It's called Holocaust Survivors, First Steps in the DP Camps and a New Beginning. So just a couple of minutes. Many of the Jewish refugees saw Europe as the graveyard of the Jewish people. Wherever they went, they were reminded of the life that had been there before. Some remained in the concentration camps, others fled. Some tried to get to mandatory Palestine, but the doors were closed by British restrictions. The United States as well had difficult immigration policies. Thousands in the end managed to get to South Africa, Australia, and South America. However, because of the excessive red tape, the increasing anti-Semitism, the difficult voyages, there was no other option for many of these people but to congregate in camps that were set up by the Allies after the war. These camps were called displaced persons camps. Conditions in the DP camps, especially at the beginning, were very difficult. Some of the camps were located in former concentration camps. Some of them were even located in former German army barracks, so that many of the survivors were walking around behind barbed wire still in their concentration camp uniforms. Food and medicine were very scarce. The death rate remained high for weeks. And still, these refugees streamed into the DP camps. For many, it would be the place where they would take their first steps forward. In teaching about these first steps, we need to ask, what are the things we take for granted that represented freedom to the survivors of the Holocaust? A book, a pen, a piece of fruit, a hot shower with soap, these were all basic things that had been taken away from those who had survived, so basic that it's hard for us today to grasp this. 
It was important and urgent to give them back their identity. Therefore, we learned their names, and when we managed to say, Good morning, Menashe. How are you, Mordechai? They were so surprised. They looked at us and could not believe that someone was calling them by name. It was not only the physical material things that needed to be restored. The survivors' faith in humanity, especially that of the children, also had to be restored. Children who had been abused, who had been hidden, who had seen death, had become very, very cynical of the adult world. Their confidence needed to be rebuilt. For instance, we can ask students to look at the poster that they see here and to try and find a deeper meaning beyond the simple act that they see. What is the adult doing besides trying to help the child put on her shoe? What does the child's body language say? Does she feel free to lean on the adult? Once children's faith in humanity was restored, once anyone's faith in humanity was restored, then these people could go ahead and start to try to rehabilitate their lives. Their thirst for knowledge is amazing. One fact is worthy of mention. Not a single pupil is late for class. They come without breakfast because the canteens open at 8.30 while school begins at 8. Anyone who is aware of the sensitivity to hunger of the former Katsetniks will appreciate their devotion to studies. For many survivors, culture and education were very important. We can ask, why were they so important when for many of these people food was still scarce they were still in mourning, and the future was still very uncertain. For many of them, culture was what represented the bridge between their <coughs> former lives. It connected them to their previous traditions. It was also a way to escape their reality. Education was the key to their futures. For instance, survivors in the DP camps published more than 70 newspapers. They had film screenings, they established sports clubs, there were theaters, there was art, there was culture. They also established schools to give the children whose lives had been interrupted vocational and educational training. In addition, they began commemoration projects. Okay, you get the idea. One, one thing that we have done in the unit again is we have taken some of these images from the DP camps and given them to you so that you and your, your students can interpret them, can see what you can see in them. You can use them to do a gallery walk. Um, you can use them in all kinds of ways, but all of these images are in the unit now. That film is not, that film is a Yad Vashem film, but you can find it online very easily. Um, and in the unit also is uh, Daniel Geslowitz. It's a very short testimony, so I'm gonna play it for you because this is really one of my favorite subjects is what happens in these camps, because remember that um, the survivors, many of the survivors, because they're all by themselves, they say, um, I'm alone, you're alone, basically, let's be alone together. So I'm scrolling Cheryl, down. Cheryl, yeah. I just want to say, look at the time. I'm just I know, Gail. Because we have two minutes left, and I know oh. you you're going to uh, play a testimony, and I'm not sure. Okay. If you could just tell us about the testimony. Of course. Yeah, of course. To ask you of course. Of so course. so outstanding. Thank oh, you. Oh, sure. No problem, Gail. I was figuring on 10 minutes for questions, but this is fine, too. We can do it like this. Daniel talks about, he talks about marriage in the camps. And that's one of my favorite subjects because I, who doesn't love a good love story, right? Um, so when you talk about weddings in the camps, you need to know that because these people were alone and they wanted to rebuild their lives, there were some days as many as seven or eight weddings in these DP camps. And this is also a, a, um, something that we have in the unit, brand new in the unit. This is a wedding invitation that emphasizes the ruptures because what you see when you translate this wedding invitation from Hebrew to English you can see that there are many, many people missing. So the groom is the son of Yitzchak Cohen of blessed memory. The bride is the daughter of Rechtman of Lask of blessed memory. The wedding takes place in the hall of Bergen Belsen. Um, so this was one of the DP camps. Um, you know, what we looked for today in a husband or wife or 
spouse, if you're talking about a sense of humor, you're talking about beautiful blue eyes, you're talking about somebody who's tall, somebody who still has all their hair. They're, they're, we look for all different kinds of things today in a husband wife, or wife or spouse. But then back then the survivors were looking for someone that they could lean on, someone who would understand them, somebody who went through the same experiences that they, do, that they did. And these love stories are really lessons about resilience and the human spirit. And of course, once they start having, once they start, um, we're gonna we're gonna skip this, but once they start um, having getting married, they also start having babies. And I left out all the baby pictures that I have, um, not my baby pictures, but the baby pictures of the survivors afterwards, just because what I wanted to do was to show you another piece of the video. So I'll keep talking. Um, I'll talk over it maybe. People got married. No, I won't be able to. They would take a hug. Um, but you, you will understand. Divided. In uh, you will understand. I'm gonna let me just move all of these. We can out. hear your voice over it. Can you? Yes, it's fine. Okay. Ten okay. Then I can also couples. try and make my volume a little the bit lower. The desire for life overcame everything. Uh, because I want you to see the stories. Th I want you to see the babies. Create babies. Life. The babies are amazing. They were building a future. All these, all these pictures of of children. Because you know, you should know Every that day. the. It, and after the, the marriages, the birth came rate in the DP in fact, camps the was higher birth than anywhere higher else than in the world. In the I think world. I'm saying that in, in the, the video right now, alone, which is just unbelievable. So, you know, this is this is where I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you because think about the camp was think about the, birth think about the fact that baby. these people who all of had these lost things were manifestations of the they survivors. Had lost everything drive and they were to still and not only trying to put their lives back together and to create a future for a new generation. So. Um, I think it really tells you a lot. All of this, all of this great stuff is now in this lesson, um, and I will stop sharing my screen and uh, and take as many questions as you want. In great, the time thank you. I just work. want to say I'm going to use your quote: "We do all the work for you." Yes, you do. Amazing. So just don't tell all my supervisors and all those people <laughs> that you know I. Truly, teachers, all your work is done for you. Certainly, we want you to um, enhance and use what's good for you. But wow, you gave us so many lesson plans. Thank you so much. And I just want to briefly say a couple of resources that you touched on that we also have in our Holocaust Center. I just want to mention that you highlighted Gerda Weissman Klein, and she is the reason I met her in 19, either 73 or 74. I'm not sure what year, don't start figuring out how old I am. And she is why I do what I do today. And um, because she was on a speaking tour of a book that she had written that was uh, all but my life. Gerda Weissman Klein went to a friend's house for a luncheon, I was invited and I met this lady with my brand new baby all those years ago, and she changed my life. And I said, this is what I want to do and continue to do. Um, you uh, talked about Leon Bass. You have no idea. Leon Bass was my principal in the city of Philadelphia. At, wow. Uh, in a triangle uh, of Benjamin Franklin High School, which they renamed Malcolm X. It's now Benjamin Franklin High School again. And I was part of that triangle. So I know a lot about Leon Bass. Wow. And um, we, I never even had shared that story with Irvin. And we went to a dedication in Philadelphia for a new Holocaust Memorial uh, section on what's called the Parkway in Philadelphia. And it, um, I said, oh my goodness, they're highlighting Leon Bass. And a woman near us said, that's my father. And so Irvin began his journey of researching uh, Leon Bass. He has a maybe a, just right before you start, he'll just briefly say he has a PowerPoint. He has all kinds of information. And we do that when we do a unit on equality and justice for all what life was like for an African-American in the United States prior to World War II, what happened when he returned. And um, Irvin's presentation is amazing. And the last part is that you talked about voices. 
And I want to just remind everybody that we had um, an ongoing, it has now stopped, writing as witness program. We now have about 75 memoirs of our local Holocaust survivors. Some of them are still with us. And I was wrong. Can you imagine? Write that down. I'm publicly saying that I was wrong. I thought, you know, when Zoom started, a Holocaust survivor, it'll never be the same, you know, as in my class. I was so wrong. It's still so powerful. So those survivors are available to you. Please contact us. I think Irvin put our phone number. Um, we will provide a classroom set of books that the survivor has written about their life story. And then your students can get to meet the survivor. And let me say this, God willing, we'll all be doing teaching about Holocaust and genocide studies in the years to come. But in the years to come, I don't know how many survivors we have that will be able to come to your classroom. Thank you, Cheryl. I'm gonna end and not say anything so we have enough time for all the questions. So I just wanna say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Everyone, please clap because you were amazing. And we have an expression next year in Jerusalem, but also next year maybe in America you will come here and have some face-to-face -face presentations and maybe a series of presentations for us at Stockton University. Thank you for continuing that bridge, <coughs> excuse me, between Yad Vashem and Stockton University. Thank you. Irvin, you are on, but before you begin, will you talk a little bit about your Leon Bass presentation, which is available to all schools. And as you know, our fee for workshops, seminars, speakers is always, always free. Irvin. Uh, sure. Um, Leon Bass's story really begins um, when he was 18 years old. Um, he didn't like school so much, um, so he decided to work at uh, what we know now as, as the uh, Reading Terminal, but it was a very arduous, it was a difficult job loading these um, train cars with, with mail, heavy mail packages, and so he decided to sign up uh, for the United States Army in 1943, um, and that was the first time that he remembers ever really coming face to face with uh, racism. Um, his parents tried very hard to shield him from the racism. They actually moved um, from the Carolinas to Philadelphia uh, for a better future for Leon Bass and his uh, brothers and sisters. And so um, he's, you know, he, he does talk about, um, you know, not, re not really being confronted with that racism until he decided to join the United States Army, where um, him and his other friends were uh, segregated at the registration uh, station in Philadelphia, where he had to go with other uh, black men to um, um, one side of the, the registration um, field station house, they called it, and his white friends had to go to another side. So um, his journey um, going through the arm, army training and even in Europe being uh, faced with this racism and, and the difficulty he had sort of reconciling what he was fighting for, um, you know, at home and abroad. So um, there's a lot about Leon Bass online. I definitely, um, I encourage everyone to look up his story, um, particularly his testimony on the, in the USC Shoah uh, database. And I do have a presentation, which is, uh, uh, like Gail said, available for, for anyone will, will, you know, in person or, or virtually. So thank, thank you. you. We're I just wish, questions. I just have to say that I wish that I had known that you knew Leon and Irvin, that you have such a great presentation because if you look at the end of this, the film, the liberation film that I showed you a clip of, you will see that we talk more about Leon. And I worked very hard to get current pictures of Leon talking to school groups, which I'm sure you probably would have had. I just didn't know to ask. We'll connect you them. with his daughter, who's lovely. Right. No, okay. it's already made, Gail. It's too okay. late. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, for next time. Okay. We're, uh, you're on with questions. And with everyone's permission, if we need to stay three minutes after, 
we will, because I want to make sure everybody has the opportunity to have their questions posed to Cheryl. Thank you. Uh, Cheryl, so the first question is, um, how do I balance the topic of liberation and loss with positive outcomes or lessons? Okay, well, I think that's what we were here to do. Um, You balance the topic of liberation and loss with positive outcomes because most of these stories do have happy endings. There were, you know, there are always survivors who didn't come back from the abyss, Um, but most of them did, and most of them made lives for themselves. Um, Many of them were, many survivors were very successful. Um, Many survivors are still with us and be still speaking to groups. Um, they, they, you know, for, for the survivors, I think the best revenge, we'll call it, was creating a family, raising a family, putting their lives back together. That's why I love the part about the weddings and the babies so much, because that in itself is the happy ending to this story. How did they manage to do that? That's the incredible part. But the, the, the human spirit comes through in the fact that they took this leap of faith and they, they, they chose to marry. They chose to bring children into the world after everything that they had been through. So, you know, I'm, that's the direction that I always go in. Um, families, yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And a follow-up question to that is, when do I introduce liberation and return to life if I, for example, only have a maximum of 10 lessons over a two-week time span? Right. That's problematic, and I understand that it's problematic, but I would devote some time to liberation because it ties up the story. It's the you know, it's the circle, you have to close the circle. Um, If you are, for instance, if you, if you find yourself using echoes and reflections, for instance, and you find yourself using Itka Zygmuntovich, who came up on one of the slides um, in connection with her, she didn't have any hair, and she saw herself in a mirror for the first time. Itka has a couple of testimonies in the final solution lesson. She was a prisoner in Auschwitz. She, She talks about her own resistance, where she wrote poetry in her head but it was very difficult for her to make it through Auschwitz. And her liberation story is also a beautiful story because after that moment where she screamed into the mirror, she had no place to go home to, she has also has a beautiful love story. She fell in love with her husband really quickly after liberation. They got married together with another one of her friends who fell in love with one of her husband's friends. It, I mean, it took them like a tiny, tiny amount of time and they got married right away and they were together for a good 50 years. It's a way to kind of go with that human story that you're telling to go all the way through. Take it all the way through. If you're teaching, for instance, if you wanna teach about Warsaw, the Warsaw ghetto, you can use Helena Birnbaum's book, um, um, All uh, Hope is the Last to Die, um, highly recommended. And you can tell the story of the Warsaw ghetto. You can use the Echoes and Reflections Resistance Unit to talk about the Warsaw ghetto uprising. And then you can spend a short amount of time using Lena Birnbaum's poem that we now have in the unit, um, uh, My Life Began from the End. So even if you can only devote a half an hour to it to tie up the stories, if you're telling a human story or if you're using a particular survivor, Finish your unit with the story of their liberation and what happened to them after liberation, because it does make them into a whole human being, and it does show you the full extent of of their Holocaust experience. I hope that helps. Thank you. Um, And then another question is, are the deaths post-liberation reflected in the 6 million deaths, or are those numbers separate? Those numbers are separate. Um, When we say the Holocaust, the Holocaust was the murder of 6 million Jews during World War II by the Nazis and their collaborators. So, and there, you know, we have three different definitions for you in the very first unit of ECHOES, which is your basic introductory unit called studying the Holocaust. Um, So since those deaths were, we define it as during the Holocaust, and caused by the Nazis and their collaborators. What happened after liberation was, I mean, indirectly 
caused by the Nazis and their collaborators, but it was also after the war, it was after the systematic mass killings were already finished. So those are numbers separate and apart from the 6 million. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. And now I will uh, let Professor Rosenthal conclude. Thank you. So I have two last items. One is, um, I hope you can see this book. It is part of our writing as witness program. And you um, spoke about after liberation, a nurse's experience. And we have someone, I'm going to mention her name because some of you, uh, you're, you like Steve Marcus and Doug Serving know Claire Lopato. And this is Claire's mother's story who decided to enlist during World War II. She didn't have a clue what she was enlisting for. She was a nurse. And so we have these memoirs, we have classroom sets of them. And um, then after you read the book, um, we will um, have you meet Claire, the daughter of uh, the nurse. And the last, and I guess it's the closing item, is that um, we have a project now uh, titled Holocaust Survivors of South Jersey. And the idea how this started was what's going to happen in years to come when Steve Marcus is retired, Doug Servey is retired, Cheryl will be retired, perhaps Gail will be retired, and people will come in and say, do you know about this particular survivor that lived in South Jersey? What do we mean South Jersey, Atlantic, Cape May, and Cumberland counties? We're a very unique area. Some of you know this because many of the survivors after liberation arrived in ports in the Northeast and they ended up coming to our area and living on poultry slash chicken farms. We have, as of today, identified over 1500 Holocaust survivors. And now we have traced their life stories, including liberation. And so our website and archive will launch on September 18th, but because you were talking so much, our focus was liberation today, we have some of those pictures now, and we're continuing to interview families, accumulate pictures, and so those of you that are teachers in New Jersey, and you don't have to be in New Jersey, if you want to personalize the story, get in touch with us, and we will show you the documents. You'll get to meet if you'd like members of a particular family, when I kept seeing the wedding pictures, so many of our wedding pictures are from the woods. They were partisans and <clears throat> they got married in the woods. So um, the Schofer family, which our Holocaust Center is named after, they had Sarah and Sam Schofer, Manya Schofer, had three weddings in the woods, in the DP camp, and then a real wedding they called in America. So, you know, and I understand that story is common. So thank you again. Thank you. You ignited so much of our creativity. You enhanced our knowledge and bravo, Cheryl, bravo to Liz, we said that. And if we were in an auditorium or even in my classroom, we'd all stand up and clap. So let's all clap for Cheryl again. Thank you so much. And we hope to either see you in Jerusalem or see you in America. I look forward to it. And if you look at the chats, you'll see so many are writing. Thank you for another great presentation. I'm reading Barry's. Have a That's great wonderful. day, everyone. And Barry, thank you so much. It's an echo. You can see everybody's writing. So thank you all. And was that your dog? This is very important. Yes, that was my yeah, dog. And regards to your dog. <laughs> and we need to know what kind of dog and the dog's name. She's big, she's white, and her name is Tiny. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank so, you yeah. for having me, Gail. Thank you for the conference. Thank you, Irvin, for all your information and your help. And thank you and, and hello to everybody out there. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to Matt Hassad, who also works with us. Right, and Matt at the center. Thank you, Matt. Sure. Give a shout out, Matt, so everybody gets to see you. Another one of my former students, now an employee. Matt, can you join us a minute? 
Yes, I'm here. here. Okay, thank you, Matt. No okay. problem. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have great, a great to see day. you. Bye. Bye. Good evening to Cheryl. Have a good night. Bye.